Hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to Operations Research. Today we're going to talk about the simplex method. Okay, so uh, it's well going to be our method for solving linear programs. So <coughs> today our purpose is to study how to solve a linear program, and we want to solve a general linear program, which means uh, for any number of variables, any number of constraints. As long as it is a linear program, we want to have a way to solve it. The algorithm that we will introduce is called the simplex method, or the simplex algorithm, which was developed by this um, professor George Danzig in 1947. At that date, there was not, at that moment, there was no single algorithm that can solve problems with more than 10 variables or 20 variables. So people's ability on that time was very limited. Since George Danzig developed the simplex method, people can start to solve difficult problems with hundreds or thousands of variables, which opens the whole fields of operations research. So the simplex method is really a fundamental idea and the foundation of many advanced methods in the field of operations research. Today, most of the commercial LP solvers, they use the simplex method as a whole or as one of the foundations. It can be shown to be very efficient for almost all the practical linear programs with just very simple ideas. So that's why we want to introduce it. With simple ideas, we can actually do a lot of things. The method in general is using an indirect way to solve all the linear programs. So we know a linear program can be of any forms. It may have um, greater than or equal to, less than or equal to constraints. It may be maximization or minimization. It may be whatever. What our strategy is, is that we will first show that all the linear programs can be transformed to a specific format called standard form. So we then will develop a method to solve standard form linear programs. Okay, So we will tell you how to solve one kind of linear program. And that's enough, because we will also tell you for any other linear programs, how may we convert them into the standard form. In the textbook, uh, you may want to read the textbook thoroughly because the materials here are mm, not really hard, but you need to spend some time on it. This lecture will be full of algebra and the theorems, so please get ready. And today's lecture will be a little bit long because we do have a lot of materials to give you. Okay, so the first thing is to talk about the standard form. Uh, first, let's give you the definition directly. We say a linear program is in its standard form if the following three conditions are satisfied. First, all the right-hand side values are non-negative. Second, all the variables are non-negative. And third, all the constraints are equality constraints. So, first, let's talk about right-hand side. If this is the first time for you to see this, this is saying, uh, calling about a constraint's right-hand side values. So in each constraint, there is a um, comparison operator, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, or an equality. In any case, for those things that we put at the right-hand side, okay, which is here, right to that operator, we call it the right-hand side value. And uh, typically, that is a constant that has nothing to do with your variable x, okay? Then we call that as the right-hand side. All those values must be non-negative. And also, all your variables should be subject to non-negative constraints. Um, should not be non-positive, should not be free. And then all the remaining functional constraints should be equality. And there is no restriction on the objective function. So let's see how may we convert any linear program into a standard form by just looking at some examples? So we do have three requirements. For the first one, we need the right-hand size to be non-negative. So that's simple. If you have a linear program in which any constraint is violating this requirement, 
like this. If you have a constraint whose right hand side is negative, all you need to do is to switch the two sides, right? Then you have another constraint whose right hand side is positive, but the two constraints are actually equivalent. So this allows you to convert any constraint violating requirement one into satisfying requirement one. Just flip the sides. The requirement two is a little bit harder. It requires us to have non-negative variables. So we know for each variable is either non-negative or non-positive or free. So if a variable is non-positive, then all we need to do is to replace it by negative itself, or we negate that variable. For example, if we have a variable that is x1 less than or equal to 0, and some other constraints, then we replace x1 by negative x1. Then that x1 becomes non-negative, and we also need to revert the sign of x1 in other constraints. The other possibility is that your xi may be free, which means at the beginning, originally, it has no sign constraint on it. It may be positive or negative. In that case, we will uh, suggest you to replace your xi by the difference of two non-negative variables. Okay, So I'm going to have two new variables. Both of them are non-negative and I replace xi by their difference, okay? So what is that? Suppose originally x1 is unrestricted in sign. Then I'm going to remove x1, but add two new variables, x1 prime and x1 prime prime. And then for this particular x1, in other functional constraints, it will also be replaced by x1 prime minus x1 prime prime. So why may we do that? Uh, here is a simple explanation. Suppose your xi is 5. Okay. Suppose in your original linear program, after you solve it, you assign 5 to xi. Then we are okay because we can have these two non-negative variables to be 5 and 0 to represent your original 5. Or if your original value is negative 8, then Still, we can set both variables to be non-negative and then have the first one to be 0, the second one to be 8. We can still express your original variable xi by these two variables, x1, xi prime and xi prime prime. So basically, we are saying for any solution in your original LP, in our new LP, we can have another solution that is equivalent to yours then we are okay. The third requirement is about equality constraints. Okay, so suppose originally we have a constraint which is less than or equal to, then all we need to do is to add a so-called slake variable into it, like this. Suppose we have 2x1 plus 3x2 less than or equal to 4. That means we can add x3 into the left-hand side and replace that inequality to equality and say x3 is non-negative, which is true, right? If originally your left-hand side is really less than your right-hand side, then your x3 will fill that gap by having a value which is the difference of the original left-hand side and right-hand side. If you have a greater than or equal to constraint, then it's the same thing. We're going to minus something from the left-hand side to make left side equalities. So for ease of exposition, typically we will just call all both kinds of variables as slake variables. So when we say there is a slake variable, that's something that measures the gap or fill the gap between the left hand sides and right hand sides of inequality constraints. Okay, we don't really uh, differentiate a slake variable from a surplus or excess variable. That's not really needed. We will call all of them or both of them just slake variables. Okay, so by doing this, you can convert an inequality to an equality. So here is a simple example that uh, we omit all the steps in between. But if you have this 
original linear program. You see there are several uh, places that violating the requirements. This guy should be positive or non-negative. So that's why we will revert the left-hand side and right-hand side. So that's why you see here this is positive, but this becomes negative. Also, you see that you have some variables that are not very good. So that's why you're going to do some replacements. You're going to replace this non-positive x2 by its negation. So these signs would become different. And also, for this free variable x3, you're going to replace it by x3 minus x4. Okay? And finally, you'll see that you have some inequality constraints. Okay? So that's why you're going to have some slick variables. So I ignored some details, but if you try to follow the three steps by yourself, you're going to be able to verify that from here to here. That's exactly our standard form. And then you may convince yourself that for any linear program, you may follow the same steps to give yourself a standard form. Okay, and sometimes we prefer to use um, compact notations. And in particular, for uh, linear programs, we want to use metrics. So a standard form linear program can be expressed like this in general. We want to minimize C transpose X. Here, uh, by default, we say a vector is a column vector. So that's why when we want to multiply two vectors, the first one should be transposed. And then subject to all our equality constraints, right? AX equals B. Oh, that's our subject to our functional constraints. And X are all non-negative. So here your X is a vector. Capital A is a matrix. Small b and small c, they are vectors. Just as some example, suppose you have a linear program like this, which you may see is a standard form. Then you have your c as your objective coefficient vector, or sometimes just objective vector, to negative 1, 0, 0. If you transpose it, you see 2, negative 1, 0, and 0. For b, that's your right-hand side vector. Okay, right-hand side vector is 5 and 4. And then finally, your a is your coefficient matrix, which is here. Okay, 1, 5, 1, 0, 3, negative 6, 0, and 1. Nothing special. Also, please convince yourself that any linear program in standard form can be expressed in this way. All we need to do is to assign a, B, and C to that particular standard form. Then we have fully defined a linear program. And by the way, you need to tell them that whether you are talking about a maximization problem or a minimization problem. Now that's obviously different. Okay, so now I would like to argue that all we need to do is to find a way to solve those standard form linear programs. Why? Because a linear program can be of multiple kinds of forms, but in any case, a standard form linear program is still a linear program. So we know as a linear program, it has some property. is that if it has an optimal solution, then it has an extreme point optimal solution. In that case, you know, all we need to do is to search among extreme points. That's the key point for doing the, the algorithm today. So the next step would be now we want to uh, understand more or investigate more about those extreme points of a standard form linear program. Because to solve a linear program, we search among extreme points. Okay? We want to have a simple way to do that. So the first thing to do is to understand them more, analyze them more to see some properties they have, so that later we may search among them easily. That's why we want to work on standard form, because for standard form linear programs, extreme points have some very good properties. Okay, thank you.